uh, some different times for that. Um, Sunday school did start, as many of you saw, if you weren't aware. Uh, next week, uh, it will be continuing on and uh, through the school year, uh, 9.45 to 10.45 between services. That uh, includes the adult class. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, and what, one thing that I think is particularly fantastic about today uh, is today is New Member Sunday. And uh, every so often, we get this great opportunity to see how God is uh, working in and through our community um, and blessing us with new members of our family of faith here at Grace. Um, there's an extra insert uh, in your bulletin that uh, will uh, give you the names of the folks that are slated uh, to join us here today um, as part of that new member right. Um, a couple of them couldn't be here, and so it's not ex exhaustive as far as who you'll see up front, um, but a pretty good guide. Um, and um, there is a reception following today's service uh, put on by our fantastic fellowship people uh, to give an opportunity for you to shake some hands and, and meet the new folks uh, that God has brought into our midst here. The theme of today's worship service centers around uh, an interesting occurrence where Jesus is invited to lunch at a uh, very significant influential Pharisee's home. And, uh, and we're going to see why he's invited to lunch, what that means, how Jesus responds, uh, and ultimately how through his, his words, his actions, and his compassion, uh, he teaches some really important lessons about how God views us versus how the world views us and how we view uh, one another. Ultimately seeing um, an unconditional love and forgiveness that uh, rests in our, our Lord and our Savior. And with that theme on our hearts and minds, I invite you to stand as we open worship with our hymn of invocation. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness, and confess before God and one another, that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, 
and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Please kneel or be seated for a time of confession. We confess together, Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to the last of us. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please stand to share the peace and joy of that forgiveness with one another. He's the Lord. with you. Let us pray. O Lord, our grace and mercy, teach us by your Holy Spirit to follow your example of your Son in true humility, that we may withstand the temptations of the devil and with pure hearts and minds avoid ungodly pride. 
Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading for today is from Proverbs chapter 25. It is the glory of the Lord to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from the silver, and the smith has material for a vessel. Take away the wicked from the presence of the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great. For it is better to be told, come up here, than to put, put lower in the presence of a noble. What your eyes have seen, do not hastily bring into court. For what will you do in the end when your neighbor puts you to shame? Argue your case with your neighbor himself and do not reveal another secret. Lest he who hears you bring shame upon you and your ill repute have no end. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from Hebrews chapter 13. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated since you are also in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear reproach he endured. For there we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel, according to St. Luke, the 14th chapter. Lord. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to dine at the house of the ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, 
Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on the Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how though they closed, they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit in the place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come to say to you, Give your place to this person, and you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place. So then when the host comes, may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He also, to the, he also said to the man who had invited him, When you give dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or your relatives, or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return, and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the cripple, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please join me in the Nicene Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, for whom us and in our salvation came down from heaven, one was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also in the house of Hodge Pilate. He suffered and was buried. Third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to the judge, both living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, whom the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. I believe in the Holy Christian and Apostolic Church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. James, you want to help me out? Good morning. Good morning. Oh, yeah. Your sword, sir. James, do you ever have a party at your house? Um, on my birthday, yes. Okay, so you did have a birthday party. Yeah. Okay, did you have it by yourself, or did other people come to it? Uh, my friends came, yes. Okay. Uh, how many friends do you think, maybe, about? Like... Uh, seven or five. Seven or five, okay. Um, who did you not invite besides me? Um, I don't know. Not your friends, right? Yeah, not All your right. friends. All right, okay. Do you think anyone else here has ever had a party where they invited people over? Probably they did. Let's find some, okay? Who has ever had a party at their house that they are willing to tell us about? Get Andrew right there. Andrew, do you have a party at your house? Yes, I've had a party at my house. What kind of party? Uh, a birthday party. A birthday party? Are you a big fan of parties? No, not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> who did you invite to your party? My friend Christian. Your friend Christian? Who did you not invite to your party? I don't know. Um... Uh, me? Okay. Who else? Can you think of one person you did not invite? Uh, 
about the president? No, I did not invite You did not. Okay. Okay. All Nobody right. Nobody ever does that. Who else has had a party at their house? Oh, come on. All right, Suke has had a party. Madison, how, how many Wayneberg parties are we going to... I did not invite him. Jacob? Yes. Uh, typical Jacob, huh? All right, can you go back there, Ms. Suk? Suk, you had a party? Many. What kind of party? Christmas, a baby Christ shower, birthday, years. Oh, boy. Um, let's choose. What was your favorite one of all of those lately? Let's I pick think one. It was Christmas party. Christmas party, okay. Who came to your Christmas party? Many of my friends. Friends? Who did so, not come to your Christmas party? People I didn't know. Okay, people you don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's do one more. Who else had a party? Can you go way back, back there? There was a Chambers party. We had a Mardi Gras party. Okay. What was and that like? What did you do to prepare for the Mardi Gras party? We decided that since the parade couldn't come to us, that we would make our own float. And then Obviously. all of the guests walked around the float, which was two-sided, so they got a lot of different trinkets as they walked around. Wow. Okay. Um, who did you invite to your Mardi Gras party? Tons of coworkers. Okay. Who did you not invite to your Mardi Gras party? People that I didn't like. Yeah. <laughs> got it. <laughs> On that note of honesty, that's a good place to stop. So, um, today Jesus gets invited to a feast, an incredible after-church lunch that even resembles a wedding. Thank you, James, so much. I appreciate you. Um, and one of the things that he does is he speaks to the host, who is a religious leader, a Pharisee, and uh, another kind of co-host, who is a lawyer, and he teaches them a lesson. Um, about uh, inviting people. He says you should not invite people who can invite you back to other occasions in the future to get paid back. You shouldn't worry about the status of the people that you invite. You should invite people who can't pay you back. You should invite people who uh, would love to attend a party, who, people who are needy, people from all over the place. And ultimately, Jesus is teaching us a lesson that he has a great feast, an incredible party like we've never seen or can't possibly imagine, just waiting for us, and he is excited to welcome us to our seat at the party. Let's pray about it. Dear Jesus, thank you for all of my family and all of my friends. and the times that we get to celebrate together. Help me to remember to be welcoming even to people I don't know. Thank you for your work to invite me to the best celebration at home in heaven. Amen. Thanks, everybody. We continue with the hymn of the day.
name of Jesus, amen. Our text starts off in a very familiar place, both, both for them and for us. So we are told that Jesus is invited to a meal at the home of what's called in the text a ruling Pharisee. Uh, a ruling Pharisee would have been probably the top-ranking religious person in that particular city or village. And the fact that Jesus is invited to a feast at his house is a little bit unusual. There are seven examples where Jesus goes to the home of a Pharisee, uh, so it's not unheard of, but noteworthy. And Jesus is invited to a meal there on the Sabbath, right after they would have been at the morning synagogue services. And that is where we understand what's going on, because this is after church lunch. And so, effectively, everybody had their plans for where they were going to eat after the services that day, and the ruling Pharisee invites Jesus to come to his house. Now, this ritual, if you will, that we engage in also, for them, was steeped in opportunity for social climbing. And so, you would invite people that were the most likely to make you look good. You, you needed to pass a couple of litmus tests first, and that is you needed someone that was ceremonially clean, of course, because otherwise any contact they have with anything or anyone makes them unclean. No one wants that. But you would need to make sure the people you invite are very likely to accept the invitation, or that would be kind of a social disgrace that's a little bit public. And depending on where you were in the social ladder or saw you, yourself, that's where you tried to invite people that were straight across or a little bit above. And for this ruling Pharisee, the person that he wants to invite the most is Jesus. And Jesus very likely was the preacher, the teacher that morning in the synagogue. And so I think we learned an important lesson here that I really like a lot, and that is the greatest honor that a person can seek is to have the preacher over for lunch. <laughs> now, when Jesus gets in the door, we are told that this ruling Pharisee and a lawyer who is helping host the event, it seems, we're watching Jesus. And that's an important detail because the, the verb they're watching, it, for one, is an ongoing kind of verb. It's not a verb that's completed. They don't just notice when he walks in the room. They're going to watch and watch and watch and watch and watch and probably beyond this occurrence. It also is a verb that implies sort of negative intent, evil intent. And so they are trying to see something that Jesus does or says that's not good. They want to trip him up. They want to trap him. They, he is their opponent. They're very antagonistic at this point. The first thing that Jesus notices as he walks into this feast is a person that is described as having dropsy. Now, that's not a term that we use a whole lot. Uh, what it is is it is a kind of a blanket term for someone who is having um, issues with heart capacity output that uh, makes water retain in their limbs and in their abdomen. Uh, it's really painful and it'd be really obvious uh, to people. Um, and we know two things then about this man for sure as he's at this feast. Uh, one, he's in a lot of pain. He's hurting, definitely. And two, the second thing is, he would almost assuredly be ceremonially unclean, which makes him kind of out of place. He would have stood out. No one would have wanted to be around him. It would have been sort of a, the one spot in the room where there was just him. Now, Jesus sees that man, and as soon as he sees him, he asks a question. He says, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And this is Jesus speaking. And so it's probably not a mousy little quiet question or a note that he slips across the table to the lawyer and the Pharisee. I think Jesus kind of command asked this question. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And we're told there was silence. And what's interesting about this question is, Every single person in the room knew the answer to this question already. And the answer to the question was no. 
Now, there's a couple of nuances, exceptions, and I'll tell you about them. If a person's life was in danger and it was the Sabbath, you could do exactly the amount necessary to triage them to survive until the sun went down and it was no longer the Sabbath, and then you could do more. Now, Jesus uh, kind of challenges a little bit later in the text um, these hosts by asking about if a, a son or an ox fell into a well, wouldn't you help them? And the animal is important because in the same kind of statute in the rabbinic rules, if an animal was in distress, not only were you allowed to help it as much as it needed, you were uh, compelled to. You must help an animal in distress. And so the law was infinitely kinder and more compassionate for animals than people. Interesting. So Jesus takes this silence, which could obviously either be a yes or a no, but was really obviously a no. And he goes up to the man that no one else wants to go around, and he puts his hand on him, and he heals him, and he kind of dismisses him from the feast. Now, this is one of those moments that I think is really easy to slide over in the text without really realizing the impact of what Jesus just did. Because remember, everybody knew that was against the law. That was wrong. So Jesus just violated um, societal norms, politeness, manners, what have you. Jesus just shredded all of them. And this occasion, this lunch, this feast at the ruling Pharisee's house was the best ticket in town. Everybody was there. Everybody who was anybody was there. And now this mega embarrassing moment happens that would look kind of like this in, in our context. Imagine you have any one of the parties we were talking about in the children's message, and everybody just sat down at a nicely set table. Jesus sits down next to Uncle Al, you know, the one with the bad back. They get to talking, get acquainted a little bit, and Jesus says, bad back, we can fix that. Let's hop right up here on the table. Just lay down. Hey, can we move the turkey to the side a little bit? Al needs some room. Oh, foot in the jello. Just scoop around it when you get your food. That'll be fine. All right, let's make some adjustments. Okay, all good. Take your seat. No one at that table cares if Al's back is any better at this point. No one. They're all so embarrassed, mortified. We all would be when this happens that the miracle of it is greatly diminished, kind of disappears into the background. That's what happens here. Now, here's the thing. No one at this feast was inherently against people being healed. No one is kind of blindly unkind to the suffering of another person. But if any one of them could have sort of put a time out on the world when Jesus asked the question of the Pharisee and the, the lawyer and talked to him about what was going to transpire, they would have probably all said the same thing. Jesus, it's like, one, the sun's going to go down by eight. Can you wait seven hours? Can, we, can you just heal him in seven hours? Maybe six. It might be early today. Can you wait six or seven hours to do this? But here's the thing. <clears throat> Jesus' answer to a question like that in any related situation would always be a resounding, immediate, absolute no. And why? Because the man's hurting. He's hurting. This is a person who was created in God's image, who Jesus in his divine nature knows everything about him. He knows his hopes and dreams. He knows when he got sick. He knows the pain he's been enduring. He knows everything about him, and he's hurting. And if we know anything about Jesus, we know his, his compassion is all-encompassing and motivating. And so for Jesus, the only thing that could be done there is to heal the man. And I like to think, too, someone with this uncurable kind of illness would have been unclean all the time, 
and no one wanted, wanted anything to do with him until Jesus touches him. For the first time, he has human contact. Someone cares, and his whole life changes. That's how Jesus sees every single one of us. Now, the second time in the text, there is silence. And so Jesus takes this opportunity to teach something, a couple of things. First of all, when Jesus would have walked in, <clears throat> there would have been the expected ordinary uh, jockeying for position around the table. Everybody wanted to sit as close to the host or guest of honor as possible at every gathering like this. And so it would have been a big commotion of uh, wanting to get these preferred places and hosts telling people they have to sit further back or further forward and organizing all that out. And Jesus simply says, don't do that. Take your place at the lowest place. And think of the honor if you get asked to come to the highest place. Furthermore, Jesus says to the hosts again, turning his attention, so everyone can hear, obviously, because this is a pin drop kind of situation. Jesus says to the hosts, when you throw things like this, how about you invite people that really have needs? How about you invite more people like him, people who are broken and hurting and in need, and this would change their world to be invited in by you to do this. So stop doing things based on what someone can do back for you. And I think the totality of all of this, if you take all of this and just add up what is Jesus saying here, what Jesus is saying here is stop keeping score all the time. Knock it off. Because you know what place is yours? The lowest place. That's your score. If you want to know your score, if you want to total it up, you've got the lowest place. That's what Jesus is saying. And I think what's interesting is Jesus tells the host that the blessings from putting forward ahead, walking in faith and blessing others and stopping keeping score and worrying about who you are in relation to other people, all of that, those blessings will be given back to you in the resurrection. That's what he says. And I think there we learn something, and that is our place, your place, the lowest place, the lowest place. That's the grave. That's death. The wages of sin is death, and there we are. His place, his place, that's the highest place. And someday, how I like to think about this, is that someday will be in the presence of that highest place, the gates, the door to heaven, standing there with our scorecard. And Jesus will look down and read off your name and proclaim your score, a perfect score. Now, of course, everyone else is going to be very impressed. They will be very impressed. God the Father will look at you and say, well done, good and faithful servant. You might yourself even be a little astonished thinking about what you knew that it really looked like before. But then Jesus will he'll look at you and smile and show you his hands and wink and say to you, welcome home. Amen. And now, may the peace of God, which certainly surpasses understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ to life everlasting. Amen. Now, I would like to invite forward um, all of those people who are uh, ready to join Grace Lutheran Church this morning uh, and members of our uh, Board of Elders forward uh, to support our new members. So if you would join me up here and remember your bulletin, please.
All right. Oh, we're almost there. Okay. Beloved in the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles, Whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Lift up your hearts, therefore, to the God of all grace and joyfully give answer to what I now ask you in the name of the Lord. Do you this day, in the presence of God and this congregation, acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in your baptism? Do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty, in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, and in the Holy Spirit? Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God and the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran Church drawn from them and confessed in the small catechism to be faithful and true? Do you intend to hear the word of God and receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word, and deed, to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? Do you desire to become a member of this congregation? Will you support the work our gracious Lord has given this congregation with your prayers and the gifts that God has given to you? Upon this, your confession of faith, I acknowledge publicly that you are members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church and of this congregation. Receive the Lord's Supper, participate with us in all the blessings of salvation that our Lord has given to his church. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Would the congregation please stand? We pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these, your sons and daughters, to the knowledge of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and enabling them both with the heart to believe and the mouth to confess his saving name. Grant that by your word and spirit they may continue steadfast in the one true faith, in the fellowship of this congregation, as together we await the day when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Let's welcome the newest members of Grace Lutheran Church. Thanks, everybody. Uh, you can head back to your seats. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the gift of divine peace and of pardon, with all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Holy Christian Church, here and scattered throughout the world, and for the proclamation of the gospel and calling of all to faith, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this nation, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For seasonable weather, and for the fruitfulness of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who labor, for those who work in difficult or dangerous positions, and for all who travel, let us pray to the Lord. For all those in need, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed and the orphan, and for all those in prison, 
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the sick and the dying, and for all those who care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for our service members, Scott, Kevin, Rachel, Josh, Michelle, Scott, Thomas, Andrew, Jim, Tim, James, Jonathan, Paul, Stephen, Randall, Chris, Stephen, Evan, Laith, Connor, Paul, and Nathan. For healing for Bonnie, Peggy, Linda, Jimmy, Maureen, Jenny, Al, Jeff, John, Smitty, Tammy, and Karen. For the Grace Renovation Project, for the people of Ukraine, and for our schools, and those who suffer with addiction, let us pray to the Lord. Finally, for those and these and all of our needs of body and soul, let us pray to the Lord. Please be seated. Please stand. <clears throat> the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come.
And our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. Now may this true body and true blood of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you steadfast in the one true faith to life everlasting. Depart in his peace and joy. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
go in peace serve the lord